His Excellency, former presidents of Romania, President Emil Constantinescu, uh, is also a driving force here at the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy. Uh, he's currently serving as the president for our Academy for Cultural Diplomacy, which is doing many things. Uh, in particular, we actually are running the only MA program in the world in international relations and cultural diplomacy uh, in partnership with Dubrovnik University in Croatia. Uh, and in that sense, that's one of the great fruits of our efforts, actually, in trying to develop further research and also further um, teaching opportunities in the field of cultural diplomacy. So for many reasons, I'm really very happy uh, that you are with us, uh, not only to give us the lecture right now, but also symbolically, given everything that you've done for the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy, in addition to your own country and for Europe. President Constantinescu was born on November 19th, 1939, in Tsigina, which is now in the Republic of Moldova. President Constantinescu has had an illustrious career, as I mentioned, in both academia as well as politics. He graduated from the University of Bucharest with a degree in law. He worked as a judge before returning to the University of Bucharest, where he undertook a doctorate in geology. He's lectured widely at some of the most important universities in the world and has received various global awards for his contributions to the field. In 1990, President Constantinescu was elected vice president of the University of Bucharest and then became its president from 1992 until 1996. He then became involved in the movement for democracy and was very soon thereafter elected to be president of Romania in 1996. Once in power, President Constantinescu went about quickly reforming the Romanian system and moving it towards a market-based economy and closer cooperation with international organizations. In the year 2000, President Constantinescu left the presidency and returned to work as a professor of geology at the University of Bucharest. He remains, however, heavily involved in politics, working uh, for many NGOs, both in Romania and internationally. He is president of the Association of Citizenship Education of the Romanian Foundation for Democracy and also the founding president uh, at the Institute for Regional Cooperation and Conflict Prevention. As I mentioned, he's serving as the president of the Academy for Cultural Diplomacy of ICD as well as a very active member of our advisory board. So ladies and gentlemen, I would ask you to give a very warm and a very sincere welcome for President Emil Constantinescu. Thank you. Thank uh, <coughs> Marx. <coughs> Good evening, my friends, students. <coughs> uh, the title <coughs> choose was Live and Ancestor of the Culture uh, Diplomacy. Uh, why uh, we need to talk <coughs> about now? The popular movements uh, from the beginning of 2010 in Tunisia, Egypt, and Syria. Uh, have uh, <coughs> drawn the attention again upon uh, to Mediterranean region. Uh, when uh, traveling, uh, when I traveling uh, this year in Tunisia, Cyprus, Egypt, uh, Montenegro, Bulgaria, and the Eastern Black Sea, I have occasion to see uh, again the same architectural Greek, Roman, Byzantine, and Ottoman vestiges. But moreover, many behavioral affinities derive from a common individual and collective psychology. As um, my country, uh, Romania, is located at the intersection of some ways that had connected this uh, areas since over two millennia ago, I have proposed to uh, ICD director to organize in Bucharest in April 2011 a conference on the Levant. Uh, Mark uh, has agreed uh, with the project and uh, even more he suggested that the topic of my speech to the annual conference uh, from December uh, 2011 would be Levant and Cultural uh, Diplomacy. Why uh, should we talk now about something uh, that seems uh, to belong only to a long gone uh, uh, past? Firstly, because uh, it seems risky to me how the economic uh, crisis made many people to look at Europe 
only like as a leading company analyzed in financial indicators. I can see the temptation, especially at those that cause the crisis, to forget <coughs> that the e European Union is primarily a model of civilization. The roots of this civilization, European civilization, Athenian democracy, Judeo-Christian religion, and Roman law code of Justin and Emperor of Byzantium uh, was in uh, Constantinople today, Istanbul, and not in Rome. And also in the East where the Islam civilization was born, too. <coughs> the construction of the European Union based on democratic ideas, law enforcement, and the Christian morality makes ridiculous those statements made by financial analysts or politicians who talk, who talk about war as a possible consequence, as a single currency collapse. These claims are not only irresponsible and foolish, but shows a misunderstanding of history. The emergence <coughs> of nation states after World War I, as a consequence of the revolutions of 1848 program against the Austrian, Ottoman, and Russian empires, triggered many energies generating progress. At the same time, states, as nation's sole representative, started regional wars and the World War First and World War II especially. It is a good time for, uh, because the culture of peace is based not only on relation between states, but also on relation between people who share common values born long before the current nation states. It is a good time for cultural diplomacy, and for us to remind the legacy which old Levant left us. What is a Levant? The dictionaries or the Google searches will not provide too much uh, explanation. For some, it is a poetic or a romantic sounding word. For others, Levantinism is a lifestyle appreciate for its enjoyment of life or derogatory treated as negligence or passion for subtle intrigues. For the etymological perspective, the word Levant was borrowed from the French Levant, rising. That is a point where the sun rises. It first appeared in English in 1497 with the original meaning of the East in general. In the biblical sense, it includes most of modern Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Israel, the Palestinian territory, sometimes part of Turkey on Iraq. Definition, definitions have varied, and uh, in the broader sense, Levant encompasses all the Mediterranean lands east of Rome, including the Black Sea area. The Levant has been described most uh, aptly as a crossroad of Western Asia, the Eastern Mediterranean, and Northern Africa. My contention is that the cultural diplomacy was born in this area and has a historic experience of many centuries in inter intercultural exchanges and intercultural dialogue. This experience was greatly stimulated and facilitated by the fact that the oriental areas of the Mediterranean were for long periods integrated in the same political realms, the great empire of East, from Alexander the Great 
to the Roman Empire, to the Byzantine and Ottoman ones. These empires evolved not as compact cultural communities, and most of the time had tolerated linguistic, cultural, and even religious diversity. As a consequence, the capacity of negotiations in own, it, its own survival by finding a cultural common ground was essential for every community and even for individuals in these uh, uh, areas. For example, in the year 155 before Christ, the city of Athens was in distress. The Romans, who were at the time the arbiters for, of all the Balkan Peninsula, imposed to the city a huge fine and money, 500 talent. Talent was the currency in, in that uh, uh, time. The Athenians decided to send an embassy to Rome to argue against this decision. A surprise, they charged with uh, this mission not a political person, but three outstanding philosophers of the three most illustrious philosophical denominations. Carneades, who was a leading of the Platonic Academy, Diogenes, the Stoic, and Critolaus, the Peripatetic. It was not for the first time, nor for the last, that a Greek city would ask its great intellectual personalities to intercede on its behalf. The first envoy to the Persian court was a scholar physician, Megasthenes. Alexander the Great also used for what uh, we could name today a cultural ambassador. Thessalus, an eminent tragic actor, Hippocrates, who accompanied the young king on his expedition into Asia and successfully acted as, uh, as uh, the envoy of Alexander to King Pixodarus of Caria in uh, 300. 36 before Christ. Ambassadors from ancient Greece to Renaissance uh, Europe were not simple diplomats. They were also adventurers who dared an uncertain fate in unknown lands, carrying uh, strange gifts like uh, greyhounds or elephants to offer them to powerful and unpredictable leaders. More often than not, they were also scholars or artists, doctors or geographers. To uh, retra retrace uh, the journeys of these uh, emissaries, take ask for the Greek Megasthenes, to the envoys of Byzantinium, who had the uninviable task of convincing Otila, the Han, to stop attacking him, them, or the first Mohammed ambassador to Egypt. Of course, we must uh, draw a line between cultural ambassadors and cultural diplomacy as a projections beyond one's own borders of one or more of the many forms of soft power. But this line <coughs> must not be too deep, for it is actually impossible to distinguish between the two. We could ask ourselves in vain if Carneades and his competitors and colleagues were chosen only as prestigious Athenian citizens and trusted by their peers to plead eloquently their cause, or with a more or less uh, a secret idea 
that the city of such distinguished philosopher was in need of sympathy and of protection. There is no straightforward answer to such a question. The greater part of these exchanges were not sponsored or organized by a state or an equivalent authority, but some of them were. Inspired by the various local experiences, the emperors themselves, or more often their courtiers or advisors, understood the value of the public display of their wisdom and magnificence in foreign realms. An important element of ambassadorial protocol was gift exchange. Exotic foods, camels, horses, elaborate clothing, goods for slaves. Accompanying uh, the gift was a diplomat message expressed in an elegant and gracious language befitting a wise ruler. Messages and letters written in elegant calligraphy might be gifts in themselves, especially if they include, included religious invocation and poetic phrases befitting the ruler status and piety. Such uh, formalities were not simply <coughs> a matter of custom and decorum. The stylized language, clocked and contained diplomatic tensions, and uh, in some cases, dangerous intrigues. Thus, not all that flourish at the border between hard power and soft power. Culture in itself was an asset, an asserting power. Baltasare Castiglione's books, Book of the Courtier, published in uh, 1528, was immediately translated into Spanish, German, French, and English in 108 editions in less than 100 years. Its uh, uh, depiction of the ideal gentleman, of how should he be educated and behave become the, becomes a touchstone for all the upper classes of Europe for the next five centuries. And uh, what, is, what was uh, the, this book? The book is written as a dialogue where the participants address the formation of the perfect courtier, including a variety of other questions, such as which form of government is best, a republic or a principality, what constitute appropriate topics for joking, uh, whether painting or sculpture is superior, the role of music. They also, was very interesting uh, detail, uh, in uh, this book um, deplored the rude and uncultivated manners of the French, who know more about fighting than literature, said Castiglione. Why? because it uh, was a bitter topic since the French, who had uh, just invaded Italy, had shown themselves clearly superior in fighting to the Italians. Castiglione's book set the cultural standards of Western Europe where the Levant had established them centuries ago. Uh, a time of violent conquest and uh, of uh, harsh monarchies there was a world of boundaries between nations in which the art of language flourished. The world uh, of the cultural and political in between, the territory of the messenger, the agent, and the ambassador. We must not divide with 
uh, to uh, deep line the frontiers between hard and soft power, between conventional and unconventional uh, diplomacy. Christianity spreading within the Roman Empire added to the ancient tradition of philosophers sent to negotiate with kings a new dimension. That of the Christian scholars who went for a way to spread the Christian view of the world. One of the earliest Christian apologetic uh, writings is entitled The Embassy. We do, know, we do not know if uh, its author, Bishop of Athens, Athenagoras, actually have pronounced it in person in front of the Roman emperor and philosopher, Marcus Aurelius. But uh, by itself, the title of the treaty, Embassy, speaks about a will to communicate from one religious perspective to another. We must add, uh, on the other hand, that the apology was tragically unsexful for the king philosopher Marx Aurelius became one of the ruthless persecutors of the Christians. With this, we can uh, open a new field of discussion about the choices, choices which confront any diplomacy, but especially the unconventional one. To be able to develop and display with success any form of soft power, we have to choose carefully both the vector and the content, the message and the messenger. The first example I have uh, quoted, that of the platonic philosopher Carneades, is quite eloquent in this respect. During uh, his stay at Rome, he attracted great notice from his eloquent speeches on philosophical subjects. He addressed the Roman Senate twice in two consecutive days with the famous orations on justice. The first oration was an apology of the Roman justice. The next day, the second oration refuted all the arguments he had made on the first. Carneades was a skeptic who attempted to prove that justice was inevitable problematic and he was also a rhetor trying to amaze the Roman public with his virtuosity. Uh, recognizing the potential danger of the argument, Cato the Elder determined the Roman Senate to send uh, the philosopher home to Athens to prevent the threat of re-examining all Roman doctrines. If uh, Athenagoras did not succeed in persuading the emperor that the Christian faith was good for Rome, his successor had enormous successes when they preached Christianity in remote realms. Few examples. Paul of Aleppo, uh, he lived between uh, 1627, 1669, was a Syrian Melkite clergyman, archdeacon, archdeacon, and who would become Metropolitan of Aleppo under the name Meleti in Damascus, and then Patriarch of Antioch under the name Macarius, which became the most uh, famous of uh, his name. He traveled to Constantinople, Wallachia, Moldavia, Ukraine, and Muscovy, raising funds and support for the Melkite uh, Church. Paul left on account of his visit, famous uh, book, the Travels of Macarius, Patriarch of Antioch, edited in Arabic, an important source 
the main events in Wallachia of Constantine Sherban rule of the Ottoman expedition in 1657. Another example, very interesting, is the Metropolitan Peter, secular name Piotr Mogila, was born into the Movilesh Maldivian Boyer family. The one that uh, gave Maldivia and Wallachia several rulers, including his own father, Jeremia Movila. His mother, Margareta, was a Hungarian noble lady. In 1608, he and his mother moved to Poland. There, the young prince learned Latin, Greek, Polish, and Ukrainian uh, languages at the Zamoyski Academy and continuing his studies in Paris. In 1632, Mohila became the Bishop of Kiev and Abbot of Pecherska Lavra, uh, is a great church in Kiev. Because, because uh, of his ties uh, to several European courts, the leadership of the Orthodox clergy entrusted him to negotiate with the Polish king and Polish same parliament to lift the repressive laws against the Orthodox Church and the restriction on the use of the Ukrainian language in schools and public offices. Mohila's uh, diplomatic talent paid off. King Vladislav IV uh, reinstated the status of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. Mohila founded at the Lavra, a school for young monks in uh, 1632. The tutoring was conducted in Latin. The students, students studied theology, philosophy, rhetoric, and classical authors. At the same time, Mohila published orthodox books <coughs> in Latin and distributed them in Eastern Europe. He wanted to strengthen the orthodox spirituality to equal that in Western Europe and created the Mohila Collegium, which later became known as the Kiev Mohila Academy, which offered a variety of discipline in Ukrainian, Latin, Greek, and Polish languages, philosophy, mathematics, including geometry, astronomy, music, and history to students from noble, clerical, gentry, Cossacks, and peasants' family. This was a huge success story of the cultural diplomacy or orthodoxy in Eastern Europe. The Ottomans were the only medieval Muslim nation to have had close contacts with the European powers, both uh, peaceful and belligerent. Since their foundation of a small principality, the Ottomans were surrounded by Muslim and non-Muslim rivals, rivals. Beginning with the early conquest in the Balkans, they were confronted with the Crusader attacks. Prevention of Christian alliance led by the Pope was a constant concern for the Ottoman statement. For this reason, they could not ignore the power balance system and diplomacy was an essential instrument in carrying out its relation with European nations. Even as the zenith of Ottoman military power during Suleiman's magnificent reign, the sublime port did not rally only on sheer force, but also looked for alliance. For uh, conclude my, my speech, the last example. In a conference delivered a few years after the First World War, the great Romanian historian Nicolae Iorga, the president rector of Bucharest University and at the same time prime minister of the government, spoke about the southeastern Europe as a heritage 
of the old East Mediterranean traditions, as there was an autonomous cultural area. He pleaded in favor of the cultural cooperation as a necessary fundament for the political action. If we ignore the culture of the people, he said, we cannot know the soul of these people. The best way for us is to build the confidence and goodwill between the peoples. The states will necessarily follow. Is there a better way to define cultural diplomacy? Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, President Konstantinescu. I think also really for enlightening us about really a period of time and also a region uh, which demonstrates quite well, as you said, uh, culture diplomacy in terms of successes as well as some of the limitations. But thank you very much uh, for the lecture. Be happy to take questions or comments. I'm sure there'll be uh, quite a few. Let's start here. And as always, if you could please introduce yourself. Um, my name is Max. I'm from Berlin, though a student in the UK of politics and international relations. And I was fascinated by the examples you gave on um, traditional roles of diplomats in empires. And as a further example that I thought of was, for instance, um, the title of ambassadress as the wife of an ambassador that has now become extinct. And the most famous example would be, for instance, Pauline de Metternich. And do you think that modern conventional democracy can reestablish this sort of organic relationship between conventional and cultural diplomacy? <coughs> if it was a go ahead, go ahead. also the answer. I, uh, I appreciate uh, your interest because uh, for me it was a change, this subject, because I have occasion to, to read again uh, many, uh, many interesting books in the history. Uh, because uh, it's important to, to come back time and time to the ancient history. Because uh, we can find in, in that times the better examples uh, for in, in many situations, but examples for actuality, <coughs> from actuality. Okay. Who would like to go next? Don't be shy. OK, here. Thank you very much for this fascinating talk. I uh, was very interested in the history that you presented in Romania's place in it. And I did not know oh, quite a lot about what you spoke. My question is about Baldessari Castiglione and his moment in 1528 in Italy. It was sort of a period of transition in Florence between a kind of republic to a courtly environment. And so a part of the perfect gentleman is navigating very difficult waters of an increasingly power-constricting courtly environment. And I'm curious to know if you can find a parallel currently in um, European or world politics where we can think about how the constrictions of power necessarily require a um, kind of a manual for ladies and gentlemen for conducting oneself, and if you see there is a lack right now. It's uh, not uh, easy <laughs> to talk about a, a parallel, because it's, uh, it's also differences. And uh, I suggest one difference, the role of women, <laughs> because don't exist before. Uh, we, uh, in many cases, uh, we have temptation to extend uh, what uh, reality to former uh, period. Um, this is a, the role of uh, ladies <laughs> now in diplomacy, in politics, is, not, is very, very important now. And uh, uh, I think um, it's very important if a new author uh, read a new book no gentlemen and lady, <laughs> lady uh, talking about this uh, role 
of the ladies leading diplomacy because uh, uh, the role of ladies existing in all history of uh, humankind, but was in underground. Now in the first place, and we have example in, uh, in uh, reality now in, in Germany and in many other, other countries. And uh, maybe you or, or other have intention to prepare a new book about uh, ladies. <coughs> Thank you very much. Is there a final question or comment? Okay, well if not, then if I could please take this opportunity to invite you also to extend our great gratitude to President Emil Constantinescu. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.